So we are Jimmy and Sarah, or Sarah and Jimmy, depending on which way you look at us first. Uh, we write for Stuff Monsters Like. It's a blog that we started on Halloween in 2010. It still goes strong, so we're really proud of that. Um, we also have a couple other sites that we write for, uh, personal sites. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Oh, we definitely do. Um, because they're going to want to rush out after this and read every single, every single one. We should direct people to Thomas Wolfe was wrong. Okay. Most definitely. One of our one of our pastimes is going around the internet and old newspapers and periodicals and brochures and find where people have decided to write the sentence Thomas Wolfe was wrong. You can't go all in. And apparently, thousands of people have written that sentence, and we find them and blog them on our. It's a Tumblr account. Yeah, it's a Tumblr, and we're up to a couple hundred, maybe over the. Close to there's there's no end in sight. You know, for some, so the whole thesis of it is, if you're going to, yeah, no, it's a cliche. Don't write Thomas Wolfe was wrong. You can't go home again because I just did on vacation or something. If that's your line, you need to rethink it. And you will probably end up in our Tumblr page one day being not shamed, but cheered. Cheered, yes. Yeah. We, yeah. Had, we had some other loads in the wrong and back to believe like. Uh, LeBron, yeah, yeah. That was a big. I think that the, the elephant in the room is uh, we should say, like, we were 20 minutes ago out in Highsmith, this building, preparing for this talk. And I was like, why does it feel so familiar? Why am I nervous? Why am I cramming before, like, this big event? And I realized, oh, I went to college here. This was my school, and it was Sarah's as well. This is kind of where we met. I was commenting earlier how interesting the, uh, the change in scenery in the cafeteria is. No. Yeah, it was totally different. I didn't get to see the cafeteria. Great, blew my mind. Okay, so. I have to live off for a couple of hours. So to give you um, kind of a, a picture of our wide variety of interests, um, we, we, for stuff monsters like, we write about monsters, um, Hannibal. Most recently, uh, we also just Thursday put out a movie review of the movie Song Fevers. Totally recommend you read that review. Uh, it's a good reflection of the quality of movie that Song Fevers is. Uh, but we also write about futurism and the nonprofit that we run where we give books to kids. So a wide variety of writing styles and interests. Uh, if you saw our talk last year, we wrote about what to do after you run out of ideas. We've been blogging for five years now, and uh, statistically that is very unusual. A lot of people uh, don't make it nearly as long, so we kind of wanted to focus on how do you generate ideas, uh, what are the best practices to keep ideas going and to keep writing. We, we noticed that uh, the enthusiasm at the beginning when you first start blogging about your fifth or sixth post when you realize that you have not built the next Huffington Post, or you're not going to be Ariana Huffington, or uh, how do you write the sixth through tenth, and how do you write the twelfth through the fifteenth? And um, so that was our talk last year. We gave some big tips. What was your big tip last year? Ask questions. Ask your readers what they want to see. Ask yourself what you want to write about. Ask the universe what's going on. Yeah. See, I asked you that question. My big one, if you're going to blog and you're going to write, you need to take them. And that was my big tip. You need to take them all the time. You need to take them when you are out to lunch with your friends. You need to take them when you're at work. You need to carry a little notebook with you or a little uh, iPad or something, a little voice recorder that you can put your notes in because I guarantee you, you're going to have an epiphany some point in the day. And you're going to say, oh my God, this is like great to write about. And then you're going to get to your computer screen in about two days, and you're going to be like, what the heck was that? And you're not going to remember. So my big tip from last year was to take notes as you're living your life. Yes, yeah, so we gave what we thought was a pretty excellent presentation last year. And afterwards, we got a lot of really awesome questions. And one of them was, but, but how long should you make your blog posts? And a couple of people asked that. And so we thought this year that that would be a good follow-up topic. Uh, 
So, so everyone should be warned that their questions after our talk today are probably going to be what we talk about next year at Word Camp. You so know why? Be warned. Because we keep notes. And we ask questions. So we've all heard the myths. I've heard several people floating around today. How long should your blog post be? Most of the experts say it's between 300 and 600 words, but you've heard people say when it comes to blogging, shorter is better because nobody has an attention span on the internet anymore. And other people say, but Google likes them super long, so they should be at least 500 words. So what we did is we weeded through all of the statistics to, to give you what might be a good answer. You have to let us know. So what do the experts say? Well, it turns out uh, that longer tends to be better for your search rankings. Uh, SERP IQ, SERP stands for Search Engine Results Page. This company, SERP IQ, uh, did some research and they found a direct correlation between the length of content and its placement on the results page. So you see at the top, that's the number one ranking at just over 2,400 words. It kind of tops out in the number two or three spots, right at 2,500 words. And then the length of the posts taper down as you get farther down the page. Which we found was surprising. They recommended, even though they're topping out at about 2,500, they're, they're recommending that the ideal block for spring is about 1,500 words. Which at 300 words a page on paper is about five pages. Right? Yeah. Is that the standard? Uh, really? Yeah. Five pages. Okay. They just write really big. Yeah. I guess. So uh, last year on BuzzSumo in 2014, they analyzed 100 million articles online, uh, which I think is a good example to, to look at. They found out that longer also inspires more shares. And if you were thinking that 1,500 words is a little longer than you'd like to write, their ideal length was 3,000 words or more, up to 10,000 words per article gets better social shares on Facebook. The big blue bar is Facebook. Um, and the other social channels are kind of underneath it. So longer does better for social shares. People pass it around Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, and other social platforms. So if you're thinking I'd rather write shorter, we have a little bit of good news for you. Um, the author of writepractice.com said that shorter is better for comments. So they don't get shared, shared on social media as much, but more people will comment on your page and engage with your site directly if your posts are about 275 words, which is even below the expert recommended for the five or 600 range. So you know what you're thinking. That was really helpful. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we totally agree. We looked at all this, and when we did the research, we kept going around in circles about what advice to give and how to narrow it down and give you a solid answer and a good focus. So this is where we hope you don't feel cheated, because we're not really going to talk about blog length anymore, because we decided it's so ambiguous. It's almost like the answer is right until you're done. Yes. Close. So we asked ourselves what we thought was the big question. When Sarah, when we were working on this presentation, Sarah, we were going back and forth in the Google Doc, and Sarah wrote WWSGD. And her name is Sarah Giavadoni. And I was like, so you're saying, what would you do? I was like, that's obviously, no, apparently not. What would Seth Godin do? He's, he's much more successful. And got better Sarah's not that narcissistic. Do you guys read Seth Godin? Have you ever? Like, he's one of our favorites. Um, his, uh, I guess his um, thesis for we found this one little article, and basically what you can kind of keep up. Now, there are people in this room who can speak to this way better than I can about staying one step ahead of Google's algorithms and keeping your SEO up and all of these things. But 
I decided, do you want to be a blogger? Do you want to write like interesting content? Do you want to have great followers? Do you want people that have great comments on your blog? Or do you want to always be on the technical aspect, staying ahead of it? And basically, we decided that, I guess we're going to say content is king. Content is king. So that was that was kind of the, the what we what we boiled it down to. Um, yeah. So Seth Godin said. So, so Seth Godin said that um, the the types of companies that focus on short term games, focus on trends, focus on rankings and statistics and popularity and shares are the type of companies that are clawing their way to the bottom. Some metaphor that he used and kind of just digging themselves into a hole that they're not going to be able to get out of once trends change and once um, popularity gets measured by different metrics. And I feel like there's there's one good word that uh, bloggers and SEO experts can refer to. This changes. Penguin or Pigeon or any of the other Google updates that everybody works so hard to get ranked on Google and then all of a sudden Google changed what they thought was important and their SEO tanked, at least momentarily. What, what we found with Penguin, I think this was from 2014, and that's the name of the Google's algorithm, um, they decided instead of doing occasional big updates to their members, they're going to do constant updates all the time. So it basically, if you're going to try to stay ahead of um, the Google algorithm, that's going to be a job in itself. And if you want to write content and you want to stay up with Google's algorithm, they're almost two separate jobs. Unless you want to make a blog about how to stay ahead of Google's algorithm, then that would be perfect. But unless that's what you want to blog about, um, it might not be your best. Uh, it might not be in your best interest to stay on top of that. So again, we just keep coming back to write brilliant content. And, and to that end, link can be definitely an important factor, but uh, it should be um, it should be worked into your considerations and not uh, an end in itself. So we think the four main factors are to consider while you're writing: usefulness, shareability, rankings, and Don't keep going paragraphs longer than you need to get your point across just because it makes your post longer because um, you're probably not going to get attention from your readers to read down that far anyways. Who was it who said that you should, the, the book should be as long as it should be but not longer? Is it Mark Twain or something? I believe. I think it was Mark Twain. Yeah, right. Yeah, so how much time does your topic need? If you're writing about your Saturday afternoon, maybe you don't need 1,500 words. But if you're writing about the financial crisis in Greece, maybe you do. So consider your topic and, and how much time it needs. Um, if you have a really long, expansive topic, if you've got 40 pages of information that you want to get out there, maybe consider dividing it up into a series of smaller ideas, writing a post about each, and then interlinking them together. And then you've got this internal link structure that helps your SEO and isn't built solely on the length of your post. If you think you can tell it in a tweet, it's probably not a blog post. So what you need to do is probably go back, rethink it, think of some other aspects of it. How can you broaden it? How can you bridge it out, connect it to bigger things? And then you might have a blog post. But if you can just tweet it, you might want to rethink it. So a good example of this we thought would be a DIY blog post. They are very important, they're super useful, and usually uh, writers don't, don't fill it with junk of content. There's a kind of step-by-step -step structure, and good writers will add a personal narrative to it, make it interesting, make it relatable, uh, but you don't, you don't wax on poetic about solar panel generation. I, the reason I picked this one is because I thought it'd be really cool to build your own solar panel. 
like you can buy them, but there has to be there must be components in them that you can build. So I uh, came across this blog called Solo Burrito. It's this guy, very fantastic. He lives in a tiny house. He builds his own solar panels. He does all of these. I think he burns cow dung to eat his bread. Uh, that might be a little too far for me, but um, it, it's kind of a cool blog, and we realized that thing, things like that that are, are highly, highly shared or highly useful, I should say. Well, that, that's a good way to do it. Shareable. Ta da. Make your content shareable. What inspires action from your readers? What gets teenagers? To pass it between each other at school when they're supposed to be studying it. Uh, oh, you don't want me to answer that. The internet. Okay, well, that's fair. Um, so the internet is a very particular medium. And again, if you if you have 17 pages worth of material and you want to get out there all at once, the maybe a blog isn't the best platform for you in that case. But uh, if you have something that will captivate your readers to share with their friends, that's engaging, that inspires action, that encourages them to pass it along on Facebook or comment at the bottom of your page, then that's what you want to aim for. Does everyone read I am nine or are you familiar with I am nine or have you seen it or looked at it? Um, it's this interesting website. It's almost like an, an infinite blog. You can go to it and scroll for days and days and days and days and days. They have all these writers that are going all over the world. They write interesting content. But Sarah and I noticed the last couple of years, they do this interesting thing. Like, they write these long form articles. Sometimes they link to other things. Sometimes they produce their own content. And then every now and then, they'll have a post that's just one sentence long. That's like, um, who is the coolest star that you have? Or something. And then people just. The comments will not stop. People, and, and it's just one sentence. Yes. One sentence inspires hundreds, of, hundreds of comments. So they seem to do this weekly, which is a good way to um, engage your readers because it's it's a regular occurrence they can expect and enjoy and plan for. Um, the latest one that I saw this week was what is the greatest fight scene of all time, and it's got this big picture of a kung fu master. And this one was actually a little long. It was 99 words. Uh, I put it in word count. Um, but that's not even in the, the triple digits of word count. And the screenshot underneath it, I took three hours after this posted. It has four likes. It has 102 comments in the first three hours up. And granted, IONI's reader base is pretty strong. But that goes to show you that short ones can generate uh, more comments necessarily than likes or shares. What is the greatest fight scene of all time, sir? I say Boondock Saints. Would you? The it's opera scene? I'd say it has to be something with Bruce Lee. I mean, he's, you know, well, they're about to do okay. It has to be. He's, he's, he's a master. So, your rankings, it is, it is still something that you want to consider, even if, if length isn't um, the only factor that contributes to it. Um, there are a number of things that go into your search engine rankings factors, and we won't go into them much here because this isn't an SEO panel. But um, um, uh, quality content and site management are very big overarching um, categories in this. And then lastly, constant lifespan. So we call this our CNN versus the New Yorker, which you go to CNN and you know that you're not getting 3,000 word articles um, for the most part. But on the New Yorker, you do. This is uh, a good question to ask yourself when you're creating content. Will this be useful in a year? A lot of these, especially I don't want to say political debates that people get into, that are will froth to the mouth that will fight someone tooth and nail over something, I guarantee you in about six months, neither of you will even remember what you were fighting about. Like, so uh, things like political um, discourse changes all the time, but what is something eternal? Or what is a blog post you could write that they could, you could write today and someone could read it in five years and still say, huh, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, so I pulled a couple articles from my bookmarks for this example. The one on the left, 
Amy Winehouse, Kurt Cobain, and the gendering of martyrdom. Why is it that Kurt Cobain is a musical martyr and Amy Winehouse was just a mess? Uh, the author wrote 1,250 words on this topic. Um, I haven't read it yet because it's still in my book, but I imagine it's great. And uh, on the right, a local blog, actual blog, our good friends do love them, you should check them out if you are local. 374 words about Brits and Soul playing at the ISIS next month. You don't really need more than that, because the show that's coming up, honestly, probably the last of your worries were just where you could find out more information about the show. Is there anyone from out of town? Anyone from? Okay, so the ISIS is a theater in town where musicians play. It's a, it's a legitimate, it's legit. yes, it's, these people aren't, like, the, right, the, yes. The name on that building's been around since the 20s. It has, it, yes. It's not a good thing. So, Patrick, you said how many words were in that? 374. You should read that, or the, I, the well, gender article. I'm seeing it. That was fantastic. I'm glad you picked that up, yeah. Uh, I read it a couple weeks ago, and, and it, it basically just talked about how like Jimi Hendrix and Kurt Cobain, and how when they obviously died by their own doings, the press, the musical press says, tragedy, um, the voice of the generation is silenced, all of this music we're not gonna get, and then when someone like Dennis Joplin or Amy Winehouse, they're like, oh, the inevitable downward decline. So it, it was interesting how the musical press handles um, Male and, male and female uh, musicians when they when they their lives, are different, especially the twenty seven others. See, so timeless content. Oh, I'll all be talking about life long lifespan. Yeah, rock and roll theories are they're golden. Okay, so we're going to do a quick recap. Um, long versus short. We've seen some good arguments either way. Whether you should go long, whether you should go short. So uh, pros and cons of long. Oh yeah, they keep your readers on the site. Um, I don't have to say any more about that. That's, that's usually what we're all wanting to do. Um, ranks higher in Google. That's what we saw earlier in the chart. More social shares. It asserts your authority. I guess. Uh, I guess that that would make sense. You don't, you know, if you're an authority on something, you're going to write more? You're going to have more to say? Perhaps. Uh, these are really self-explanatory. Right. <laughs> I'm wondering what more I can add to these. Right. Uh, increases likelihood of quality backlinks and provides value. We, we kind of took that one from another list. I think short form posts can provide value too. You may not put it as that you're looking for. But generally speaking, the long ones are expected to. Um, so cons, massive time and effort especially if you were writing long posts regularly. It just it requires more time to, to write, to research, to edit. Um, if you're like us, you probably have three jobs and kids and a life, and you want to do stuff, and you have hobbies, and you can't write for 12 hours a day. I wish we could. And it also requires more time from your readers, who, like me, maybe bookmark it and save it for later, So uh, maybe too overwhelming for the readers to get through. I know I've clicked on some posts before, and I got all the way to the bottom, and then it turned out it was page one of six. And I said, no, ain't nobody got time for that. Um, and, and depending on the type of writer you are, you also run the risk of being less focused. If you go off on tangents, if you kind of come to a topic circuitously, uh, you, you run the risk of not being able to focus as well as you would otherwise which can also turn away your readers. Short-form posts, we can run those because these are also slides. This is kind of where I'm defaulting lately. I, I'm kind of falling into the camp where the things I blog about, I'm trying to write less and less words because I used to try to write pages and pages on one post, and now I'm trying to, it, it's good writing, actually. Uh, if, you can, if you can say everything that you're going to say in this, and say it in that, that, I think it makes you a better writer, at least it does for me. Um, and it takes less time. Uh, you know, 
have 47 things to do. She's really sweet and I love her, but 
everything you write, she likes to do a little too much, and she can't be very critical. So you might not want to let her read it, but you might want to find someone you trust who can read it. And consider building graphics to help you tell the story. If you have something really complicated to explain, instead of spending paragraph after paragraph, try to put together a visual, just a, a JPEG that you can stick in the middle and say, well, as you can see, this just goes like that. And that'll, that'll make your, um, that'll give your readers something to look at if it's visual, if they're visual learners, and it can help you save that space if you tend to write long. If you write short and you want to make them longer, add a personal narrative. In fact, this is a good tip for a lot of writing. A lot of readers, when they come to your blog, they want, this sounds weird to say, but they want you in it. Like they want to hear your voice. They want to see the parts of your life that maybe reflect theirs. But they want a narrative. They want a human voice. They want to know that like some robot is cranking this out. So putting your personal narrative in it, if you, if you write about um, you know, making nut bread tomorrow, but like this funny thing happened with your sister when she called you right in the middle of it, and it's so relevant. I would probably put that in. I found a good uh, craft blog around July 4th where the Make author- Make your fireworks? It was something like that. But the author had um, uh, like a bloopers section at the bottom where she uh, said, here's what I did wrong, don't do this. And I thought for a craft blog, that was a really good idea. Did it have pictures? Or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bad craft pictures? Yeah, well, it was a paint thing, and there was white paint, but she put it on white paper the first time, and that was a bad idea, so that's why she recommends craft plates, but it was a thing. But it, it showed you that not even a simple paint project, people should get it wrong the first time. Learn from her mistakes. I didn't see the pictures, but I still feel like I could mess up painting more than she did. <laughs> I just did. I'm, I'm just imagining. Reformat just to make it look longer. If you're the type of person that just writes one big paragraph for your short post, try stretching that out. If you've got one sentence of a whole bunch of things that are comma separated, make a bulleted list instead of just one sentence. Um, different headings. And also help the reader flow through your post. We could probably do a whole session on just how to make your posts look pretty. That would be all you. Okay. She's our esthetician. Is that the word? Sure. <coughs> and that add images, graphics, and video. Has everyone designed a logo for their blog? Do you have a specific look, a graphic that is just yours? That it's on your Twitter, it's on your Facebook, it's the head of your blog. That's a great way. Uh, I think all, a lot of the blogs we do, even <coughs> even WordPress has the little W, you know? You, you, look, you see that W on someone's windshield, you know, they got the little V down, you're like, oh, it's WordPress. So it works. It doesn't have to tell you anything. It tells you in a logo everything you need to know. And there's some great uh, resources out there if you're not a graphic designer by shape or by hobby. Uh, sites like Canva, C-A-N-V-A, is a good one. They've got um, templates that are already sized for social media so that you can put images in your post that share well on your social media channels. They do really interesting things with that. So now the elephant in the room. Oh no, I'm, I messed up because remember at the beginning of this I said, so there's two elements. We have two elements in the room. Who's the second element? Your audience. Did anybody think about what they want to read? Uh, we found this graphic online that um, the site, and, and we've got um, references in our slides, but this site called um, it your 1,000 True Fans. Everybody wants to be in the red section. They want to have this huge spike of popularity, even with um, a few products. But most people end up in that long tail. And um, this post recommended that if you if you can find your 1,000 true fans, or your 100 true fans, if you're just getting started, your 10 true fans, uh, that they will, it, it goes back to that 80 20 rule. 20% of your readers are going to end up consuming 80% of your content. They're the ones that you want to market towards, and they're the ones that are going to help you generate your. Uh, 
responsibility, however you consider that to be for your blog, whether it's monetization or product sales or whatever you're measuring, those true fans are going to be the ones that come back over and over, read your stuff, buy your book, come see your speeches. The 1,000 true fans theory is from this uh, blog called The Technium. It's by this guy named Kevin Kelly, who in the 70s helped put out uh, the Whole Earth catalog, which was really cool if you ever see any of those old ones. And then he later moved on to um, be one of the founders of Wired Magazine. And this is on his blog. And, and it doesn't just go for readers, but a thousand true fans is enough to support yourself uh, at a job. Like it, it, it can become your job to have a thousand true fans. Yeah, he said that if you can, if you can get your thousand true fans to buy into you at hundred dollars a year, whatever that is, ticket sales, book sales, whatever it is, then that's a hundred thousand dollars a year for you. That that's good money, right? Especially Actually. in that show. <laughs> So that's what we got. This is your conclusion picture. It's, it's not the link, it's what you do with it. So we recommend that you consider uh, your topic, your blog, and your readers as you go along. And again, if you're looking to two circles, if you just want to rank higher, if you just want to get more comments, then you can adjust your link to those. Uh, but we recommend keeping, keeping your readers in mind as you go. So really, in conclusion, we, we told everyone coming in here we were going to talk about blog links, but we didn't really do that a lot. We didn't really talk about links that much. It was kind of like a side topic. Do you think they feel cheated? Do you guys feel cheated? Both of us. I hope not. Well, are there any questions? I have slide references, which refer specifically to slides that um, when this is posted, you can go back to. And some additional reading if you're the type of person who likes homework, including our other sites. Um, but this is us, and if you want to be one of our thousand true fans, you're welcome to buy our book. Be our thousand and one. Yeah. Is that a word? One thousand and first. One thousand and one. One thousand first. So we have, I guess, about ten minutes. If anyone has a burning question that they will not feel good with leaving without asking, go. Oh. I agree with you. I, I think that 
I don't want to call it the Twitterization of the internet, but ever since Twitter, uh, back in 03, 04, blogs were a very solid uh, go-to form. I mean, they were they were solid form. And then Twitter, and now um, blogs, a uh, typical blog would be, here's five cats that remind you of your Thanksgiving dinner with your parents. Here's the end, like, it's just five pictures. It's just, here's a cat, here's a cat, here's a cat. And that's a blog now. So I kind of agree with you that we have, um, you know, crossed the Rubicon on that. Like, I don't know how, I'm, that's but a good Has anybody ever seen BuzzFeed Without Words? I think it's the Tumblr page. They take BuzzFeed articles and they take the photos and the gifts out of them and just leave you whatever's left. And it's, it's literally five cats that remind you of Thanksgiving. Here's the cat, here's the cat, here's the, that's the coffee. Because that's all they have is so here's the cat and then a photo. Here's the cat and a photo. So they take the photos out and what you're left with is really nothing substantial content-wise. So a typical blog post can have 14 words. So I, I kind of agree with you. I think we've, uh, I don't know, our attention span's getting shorter. I, well, maybe people are more interested in getting content than. Yeah, it, I think it all depends on what your goals are. If, if that's what you're focused on, if you're focused on getting people to engage directly in the site, or if you'd rather have your, your Facebook rankings bump, or if you'd rather just move up that extra place on Google, I think you have to weigh your goals with your strategy. Has anyone seen the movie Ju Julia and Julia? Is that the movie? <coughs> Julia and Julia? So, um... Have you? Yes, I've seen it. And there's this great scene where her, her blog, her food blog, gets to be like it's one of the top five on Salon or... So I forget whatever who's ranking the blog. And she's like, I have dozens of comments, which means think of all the people reading it who didn't comment. I think, I think uh, so if the, every one of these metrics, I want to say, every one of these metrics is its own trap in a way. Uh, I, I want to be careful of saying that, but like, you know, if you're just going for comments, if you're just going for click-throughs, you're just going for SEO page ranking, they can become their own trap in themselves. So I, I think that's what we kind of wanted to demonstrate is that length is definitely an important factor and there's statistics to back up why you should do it one way or another way, but if, if you're just focusing on one factor, then you're missing out on all the others that give you the holistic growth that, that means more in the long run. Sir? Maybe this is your topic for These, these books, no, we wanted to do something to, um, these books were not a project initiated by us, we were kind of just co-authors. Um, they are movie reviews, and it was orchestrated by the College Sport Historical Society, it's a, a blog about Dark Shadows. So we contributed some movie reviews to these books, but they aren't ours specifically. This gentleman saw that Sarah and I have a really good talent for watching bad movies, <coughs> writing hilarious content about them, and I think we did just that. Oh, yeah, we did. We used 2016 in Valley of Yeah. Really bad for us, I should say. Any other questions? Do you have any feelings about when you are writing for a blog, should you use normal language in an actual paragraph so that your English teacher wouldn't be horrified, or there's this school of writing blogs that every sentence So writing styles, yeah, um, we actually have very different writing styles, and I think part of that just comes from the topics that we tend to pick up. I think you tend to write sh more shorter paragraphs. I'm a little more verbose, at least right now. And I think it largely depends on the topic at hand, too. I also write for my company blog, and we do with marketing for private colleges, and so I try to be a little more professional, a little more traditional with that than we do with the monster blog, for sure. I say your content, or the form of your content, should be your own. 
uh, I really think you should you should have ownership of the blog. You name it, you create it, you curate it, you give it its look and feel. I, I don't know if there's a, I think that that you need to make it like your own thing. I say. I know the ones that say, this, I will teach you how to get a thousand fans tomorrow, and then I click on that, and it's this post, and I keep reading, and I keep reading, and I keep reading, and then at the bottom it's like, and here's my book, or here's my, what well, we just sell, we try to sell them our books for what, anyway. Uh, but, you know, we get to the bottom, it's like, and here's my audio book, or here's my, so yeah, I think that's kind of a lead on her. Put on but, but in terms of the layout of your post itself, um, I don't know if you went to one of the sessions earlier with the heat maps that show you where people's eyes gravitate. I think I think the trend towards shorter paragraphs and spacing things out more is to help your readers scan through it more quickly. And headlines do that too, and title taglines, um, so that readers who are coming to you for specific information that they're looking for can find it more quickly and it's not lost in this giant chunk of the paragraph that they're not going to read completely. Yeah, I like internal headlines. I like, you know, three paragraphs, then another headline of what this is, and then another headline. That's how I like it. 